In the early 1990s, Jeff Emig leapt from his Midwest family motorsports roots to international motocross stardom. His speed on the track matched only by the off-track pace of his rock and roll lifestyle. He paid a price for that, and we can't help but wonder how many races and championships he might have won had a nickel-dime pot bust and back-to-back -back injuries not cut short his career. But the story ends happily. Jeff found focus in his life, overcame the challenge of a speech impediment, and thanks in part to his Supercross broadcasting career, remains one of the most visible and popular of past moto heroes. This week, we'll find out why. To race, you have to believe you're gonna win. I can't picture my life without drag racing. I will do anything it takes to win at any time. You didn't want me behind you when the two-lap card came out. Do the best every single time. And that side-by-side, 300-mile-an-hour, rock and roll, ground shaking. One move inside, outside, and the game's over. Everybody needs to have the, the feeling of the win in, in their heart, or they're going to give up quick. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. Jeff Emig, welcome to the show. I thought I had him. I thought I had you convinced to break out the guitar and give us just eight bars. No sale. No, I just, uh, I haven't really played that much in a while and so I'm a little bit nervous about it. What but like I said, I could, I could probably give you some air drums. I'm definitely in the Hall of Fame I'm for air drums while I'm driving. I'm hoping you got something to help me out a little bit and you do yeah. this while driving, I understand. Yeah, I'm, I'm really good, especially when nobody's around. I seem to be an exceptional air drummer. So. We joke about the music. I gather it plays some significant role in your life given that you named your kids Presley and Jagger. Yeah. Elaborate. Yeah. What, how, I mean, was that just a lark, or are you a well, pretty big music guy? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, the names were all uh, my wife, uh, Jennifer, th those were her uh, names for the kids. She already had those picked out, uh, okay. you know, w when we were married. And she says, um, you know, after this, you can name the third kid. <laughs> but it wasn't until after we had two kids that she's like, I only want to have two kids. <laughs> so, yeah. So but, maybe there's no musical yeah, connection. Yeah, but you know, music has always played a, a big role, um, you know, um, in my life. Uh, Led Zeppelin certainly has been a band that is uh, always the go-to, uh, the staple. And my wife has always been in love with Mick Jagger. Okay. Um, met Mick Jagger at a bachelor party in Vegas and uh, spent some time with him and just had this really amazing moment. And, and so, you know, she's been a Rolling Stones fan her whole life. I'm a Zeppelin fan. I always, one of the things I like about this gig is that no matter how much research you do, there's always this bit that just sort of falls into your lap. We're sitting here getting ready to do the show and you're looking at those race cars and saying, that could have been me. I knew your dad was a racer. I mean, I knew that, he, that you came from roots. Mm -hmm. But elaborate on that. Tell, tell, tell me the degree to which the Emig family was just eaten up with motorsports. Yeah, I mean, my earliest memories are, are being in our race shop. Uh, my dad was a big time race car builder in the Midwest, you know, SEMA chassis builder, engine builder, everything from the ground up. And I remember the dyno, you know, when we were kids, that was like our spaceship, you know, and dad's like, don't be messing with that or that. And my brother and I are, and, um, and there were, you know, every, anything from World of Outlaws to circle track to uh, drag racing, everything you can think of. And so, um, you know, I look back on it now that motorsports in some form was going to be my future, you know, me and my brother. And then in 74-ish, um, my dad and his and his buddies they all got dirt bikes of course in the early 70s motocross was such a uh, you know a new thing and by 1975 that was our family hobby and by 79 we were full-on amateur motocross racing by 83 my dad had built his last race car and we were strictly working on uh, motocross bikes before we go to break I, you owe me this top three guitar players of all time on the Jeff Emick list Ooh, Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, um, Jimmy Page, of course, and uh, I think lately I've really been into uh, some Jimi Hendrix. I think he's a very interesting guy. That's a pretty good list. Got to put Keith on there just based on uh, He is. Sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> Keith Richards. And, uh, to Ronnie Jeff Wood. Evans. We're going to come back and talk a whole lot more about motocross, never mind the music, as we continue our conversation with the GM. Welcome back. Uh, just to quickly review, he didn't bring his uh, guitar. He does play decent uh, air drums. We got through the uh, top three players list. More to the point, the transition from cars to bikes in your family mm -hmm. 
there's a, there has to be a point then when it becomes serious. When did that moment come? Um, in the summer of 1986, uh, Ponca City, the NMA Nationals, that was, that was the race Mini at the time. Um, and the 80cc stock class where you know the bikes are supposed to be even you know type of thing that was like that was the one class and and i won that race and i had pulled off the track and it was the first time that i'd seen my father cry i really knew that i had done something uh, significant on that day let's fast forward from that to 92. Mm. you were in the 125 national class and you won your first race your first national mm -hmm. And then you won all the rest of them. Yeah, all, you, but, all but all one, but one, yeah. How does that happen? You know, that's just when things start to come together for you. And and fortunately for me is is that when I, at one point, I believe I was 86, 83, something, a large amount of points down, maybe yeah. the biggest gap ever to come back to win the title. When Mike LaRocco had some uh, mechanical problems and I'm scoring 22, 25 points a moto, that doesn't hurt. But when, it, in, when an individual has problems, whether it be an injury or a bike problem, um, you have to be there to take advantage of that. And so when it came time for us to go to Bud's Creek, it was like business usual. This is the time when I have the opportunity to win my first professional championship. Sorry, Dad, you're staying at home. Sister, brother, nobody. It's business usual. We are not done until we're done. Uh, when it really came down to it, that battle between uh, LaRocco and I, um, I, I just stayed so incredibly focused. And, if, and of course, that day, too, he had problems also out of uh, frustration. But, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a big, big day for us, no doubt. That 92 season ended with the motocross donations. We were supposed to lose after 11 yeah. years because you guys were a bunch of beginners, you know, rookies. Uh, Is and that instead, why they said the B team was because we were the beginner team? I think that was it, yes. B for beginner. I thought beginner. it just meant second. The second <laughs> no, choice. it was just beginner because you had so little experience. How, where does that ride rate among your great rides of your career? I feel like it rates right up there. The, the, the fact that, that even uh, having Roy Jansen as the team manager, uh, Billy Lyles, Mike LaRocco, we weren't the, the first pick to go. And we all had exceptional days. Nobody finished worse than a second. And it was a battle. I mean, it was a battle down to the end. I, as a 125 rider, um, I rode the first two of three motos, so the final moto I had to watch, you know, chewing mm. my nails, and and so it was the first experience of the motocross of nations, and to to win it, um, and then in the fashion that we did, it was, uh, and it was uh, just such an exciting moment. I was watching a YouTube clip from that event, and you looked about 14, yeah, and deer in the headlights, scared. And it took me back to the first time I interviewed you. Oh. And I thought. That couldn't this, have been good. This kid rides like a rocket, but he has this terrible stutter. Yeah. How's he ever going to be able to live up to his potential bearing that, dare I say, in these political, politically correct times, handicap? Yeah. Well, you just overcame it. And I'm curious to know how you did that. First off, I think that I found a way, I found some bridges, and I still use them. During this interview, I have used techniques, right? So during this interview, I've actually, in my mind, I've gotten stuck on a word, but I found a way with my speech patterns to where you guys are just used to it. Okay. But for me, I know the difference. And I told the story for the first time about a year ago on a CBS uh, special that we did about in 250 Supercross, back in the early 90s, mid 90s, uh, before the main event, each rider would have their helmet off. They'd come down the line with the microphone. Mm -hmm. And at the point when you're supposed to have the most confidence in yourself, right? You're beating your chest, you're, that mic is coming towards me and I just wanted to literally turn around and say, I can't do this. And so part of overcoming it, th this speech impediment is the, uh, the repetition, and the fact that I had to, there's no way around it. Also inside of me, I think has always, there's always been a voice and I've always had that. And, and maybe because when I was younger, I couldn't get that word out or I couldn't speak up at times. And so then once I, through my racing, I gained enough confidence and self-esteem 
that I could start start to do that. And by the mid '90s is when I think my true personality and stuff really started to shine or or to show. I should say. I don't know if people think it shines, but but you know it definitely started to show. That's a great story, a great success story. We'll take a commercial break on, on that note and come back with what wasn't such a great success story, how you managed to get yourself fired from Kawasaki. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Let's open the toolbox. We'll go to the Carlisle Tool Celebrity Fan Question of the Week. Hey Jeff, what's up? It's Cameron. I just wanted to ask you, uh, was it kind of gnarly with the factory days uh, being on the dirt bike teams and breaking off and going to do the Krusty Demon stuff because really that was huge groundbreaking stuff that me and everybody else are stoked you were a part of? Well, it, it definitely was an interesting time in the early 90s when the video guys start coming around and saying, hey, we want to video you guys. And of course, the one of the first ones was this crusty demons of dirt, a bunch of snowboard guys uh, with video cameras. And so we had spent so much time riding in Glamis and Ritchie Canyon and out in the desert and doing all this free riding is that it was really interesting to put it on film. Um, and so at the time, you didn't think much of it because we would have all signed contracts and asked them for royalties for them to come out. But we did all that writing for free. Wow. You know? It was just, we were stoked that they were that they were gonna show it. Um, the very first Krusty Demons of Dirt had the, my backyard barbecue. We we're riding Z50s around in a little circle. And that that spawned the whole mini bike revolution. Mm. Just us riding, you know, riding alone mini bikes in the backyard. And so we had a real desire to be different than uh, the guys like Jeff Stanton or Mike Kudrowski and Mike LaRocco and these these guys that, you know, in my mind, these were the guys that were known for being these hard trainers. And they're like, and I'm like, whoa, I don't want to train. <laughs> I did. I did. And that's the misconception because my image was that I don't ever do that. I, don't, yeah. I didn't want to train with nobody. I didn't want nobody knowing that I even owned a pair of running shoes. The rock and roll lifestyle, if it's fair to characterize it that way. It was for you, me. You got busted. Mm-hmm. In the end, it was a paraphernalia bust, and it's sort of odd looking back from the era in which legalization seems to be inevitable. We're going to treat pot like we treat yeah. alcohol. That it cost you your rot. I mean, you you went from here to here. As you look back on that now, I mean, how do you feel about it? And what would you say to a kid today about how to deal with everything you've just described? Well. I mean, at age 44, I look back on it and I go, wow, that was really silly. You know, I, I just, I've always been um, a bit immature for my age, and I think that, that was a really good example of, of uh, you know, I was uh, 29 years old, let's say 20, 28, a uh, professional on, racer, a multi-time champion. And um, it's interesting, I, I learned so much from Bruce Sternstrom, who was the team manager at uh, Kawasaki at the time. They find out about it. And I get to call on Thursday, and Bruce says, look, I spoke with uh, Japan, spoke with all the bosses here at uh, Irvine, and we've decided that we're going to let you go. And they left it up to me, and it's my call. And I was always, always really tight with Bruce. Mm. Right when I got the call, the next call I had to make was to my dad. It's like, hey, Dad, hey, how's it going? I said, well, something's come up, because he didn't know anything about anything. I said, hey, I got in trouble last weekend out in Lake Havasu, and Kawasaki has fired me. And that was, that was the toughest thing I've ever done. Oh, but. And my dad was incredible. He says, well, he says, you weren't happy riding that bike anyway. Let's get you on a different bike and get you focused on what you need to do. I'm like, no, 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 Gary, I'm like, please, can I have Gary? <laughs> you know, you wait. But he was, he was very, very understanding and very uh, positive. And I think that his uh, response to it, um, man, it meant the world to me. I'll bet. And so the other thing that I did throughout that whole time period is that I took responsibility for my own actions. Mm. And I never blamed Kawasaki. And, you know, I decided I need some clarity in life, drug and alcohol rehab, all these sort of things like, okay, what do I want to do with my life? Because right now I'm not going in the right direction. And so fortunately, fortunately, I made some changes in my life. Uh, there was a race in Paris and I 
it, it really wasn't expected to even be on the podium. It rained a bunch, and, and I finished this third. And I remember being up on the podium um, thinking, wow, this is like the greatest third I've ever got in my life. And then afterwards, I walked out in the middle of uh, the... Um, there was a, a soccer field in the middle of the track and the rain's coming down, you can see it coming through the lights and I remember just like praying to this higher power like please just give me a sign like what am I supposed to do with my life like and it just hit me like okay this is it you can do this you're gonna get back on top and at that point that was a really interesting moment I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it but and then I, you know a few weeks later I win uh, the US Open. What strikes me about that is you have this Revelation. Well, you, you blow it. You make the huge Big mistake. time, yeah. I'm that get, guy. <laughs> Dad gives you that bit of support. You get sort of back on your feet racing-wise. You make the decision, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start my own team. I'm going to head down yeah. this road. I'm going back to the top. And then, bang, you get hurt. And then you heal up. And then, bang, you get really hurt. Oh, yeah. And it's done. I mean, you must have felt like you're rebirth didn't last very long. It, it didn't, but I can tell you that if I hadn't been clean and sober and, and achieved this sort of clarity in my life, when I broke my wrist a week before Supercross started and then four months later I break my leg and back and that was it, I knew right then, I, that, that transition would have been so rough. It's, I don't think people understand how rough it is for us to just stop racing. Um, and I can tell you that day at Glen Helen when I broke my back and, and leg is that I knew right away. I mean, I, 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 at first I thought I was paralyzed, then I wasn't, but it was like 30 seconds of going through that. And then that moment happened, and I, it, it's like in the movie Ghost with, with uh, Patrick Swayze. I promise you I was laying there and I felt this, and I call it my racing spirit, said, that's it. Done. And I remember just, get the ambulance here and you'll be all right. But I knew right then that that was it. There was no going back. And that racing spirit, that guy that is like, I will do anything it takes to win at any time, gone. So I've never looked back. Wow. Yeah. We'll take a commercial break and come back and finish our conversation with Jeff Emig. Welcome back. We're talking with Jeff Emig. Yes, the numbers are impressive. You can't help but wonder how much more impressive they might have been uh, but for those injuries that uh, ended his career. So in terms of the difficulty of the task and the way you go about accomplishing it, how does winning a Supercross championship today compare with when you did it? There's a lot more moving parts. There's a, there's a lot of people around the team. The machine is much more technical. The obligations when it comes to media and press and things like that, definitely um, there's more of that. And you have to be a better athlete, especially in 2015, the level of fitness and preparation that the field has, I, I personally think is the greatest that we've ever seen. And uh, I mean, I think, that, I think that the riders are putting out a tremendous effort and, and I think that it shows, but it is not an easy task because there's only one Supercross champion every year. Given everything we've talked about, who you were, who you became, where you came from, and all the rest of that. Could you make it today? If you were starting, if you were 16, 17, living in that world you just described? I think so. Because there was, there was one comment that my dad made to me uh, on, the, on the phone one night and, and um, calls me up and he says, wow, that was really great on the broadcast. You know, I was doing uh, television at that point. And, he, and uh, I said, man, as bad as I stuttered when I was little, you know, did you ever think that I could be doing this? This is what I do. I'm one of the voices of the sport. And he says, you know, Jeff, he says, you're the type of person that whenever you set your mind to, you're going to get it done. And so I would have to believe that when I set my mind to something, if it was to be Supercross champion in 2015, that I'd be able to get it done. You may have just answered my last question. We ask everybody the same question. Of all the things that you've done in your life, racing and otherwise, what makes you most proud? That phone call could be the answer. I wonder if there... Could be. Dave, don't make me cry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very proud of my family. 
I'm very proud of uh, the friendships that I have, proud of my racing career, but there's still so much more work to do that I, they, they, we haven't written the final chapter. That's right. Next time we're going to make you bring the guitar. That's right. And finally, speaking of rock and roll, it was the concert impresario turned motorcycle race promoter Mike Goodwin's wild idea, hatched in the early 70s, to run a motocross race inside the L.A. Coliseum. First time I laid eyes on Mike, he rolled up in a chauffeured Excalibur, wearing a floor-length ermine coat, a character as flamboyant and outrageous as the race he conceived. Goodwin's concept was an instant success and quickly grew into the nationwide series of stadium races we now know as Supercross. The bad news? That success put him on a collision course with the racing icon Mickey Thompson, who saw a similar merit in racing buggies and trucks in stadiums. The two worked together for a while, then had a bitter falling out. Not long thereafter, Mickey and his wife Trudy were murdered, gunned down in their driveway. And nine years after that, in January 2007, Goodwin was convicted of masterminding the killing and remains in prison, serving a life sentence while his supporters, via the Friends of Michael Goodwin website, continue their quest to have his conviction overturned. Meanwhile, Supercross has passed through a number of corporate hands and become one of the great racing success stories of the last 40 years. But credit for the original idea clearly belongs to the convicted murderer who is also the father of Supercross, Mike Goodwin. That's it for now. I'm Dave Despain. I'll see you next week.